Let's begin our review of pediatric cardiovascular disorders with congenital heart defects. They are among the most common of all birth defects and are the leading cause of birth defect related deaths. Some congenital heart problems are so minor that the infant remains apparently healthy for many years after birth, while others are so severe that they are immediately life threatening. Heart defects develop in the early weeks of pregnancy when the heart is forming and can affect any of the different parts or functions of the heart. Some babies and children with heart defects are essentially asymptomatic and a heart problem is only suspected when a healthcare provider hears a murmur. Of course, children with normal hearts can have innocent or functional murmurs, so diagnostic tests might be done to rule out a pathological cause. Congenital heart defects can prevent the proper flow of blood to the lungs or other parts of the body. This leads to congestive heart failure with hypoxia, tachycardia, and dyspnea, especially during exercise or stressful activities, such as in infants, the work of feeding, which could result in an adequate weight gain. Edema of the legs or abdomen or around the eyes is another sign. Some heart defects cause cyanosis, usually appearing soon after birth, during infancy, or even later in childhood. Children who have cyanosis may tire easily, exhibiting symptoms such as shortness of breath and fainting, made worse with exertion. Some children assume a squatting position frequently in an effort to make it easier to breathe and to decrease venous blood return, which in turn decreases the heart's workload. Intolerance of a supine position is fairly common in infants with heart defects because of the congestion and hypoxia that result. In most cases, the reason a baby's heart develops abnormally is unknown. Both genetic and environmental factors play a role. Women who are poorly nourished and older mothers are at risk. Women who contract rubella during the first three months of pregnancy have a high risk of having a baby with a congenital heart defect. Other viral infections, such as Coxsackie virus, can also contribute. Certain medications are also known to increase the risk, including the acne medication isotretinoin, trade name Accutane, lithium, and anti-seizure medications. Alcohol abuse during pregnancy also increases the risk of heart defects, so babies with fetal alcohol syndrome often have them. Cocaine use during pregnancy also increases the risk. Chronic illnesses such as maternal diabetes represent an increased risk for congenital heart defects, although the risk can be reduced if blood glucose is tightly controlled before and during pregnancy. Women who have PKU are also at high risk of having a baby with a heart defect, unless they follow the recommended diet beginning before pregnancy. These malformations are more likely to occur in siblings or children of people who have heart defects than in unaffected families, strongly suggesting a mutagenic connection. Heart defects also appear as a component of a wider pattern of birth defects. For example, more than one-third of children with Down syndrome have heart defects. Your role is to identify children with signs and symptoms of congenital heart disease and make referrals for immediate medical evaluation. You'll also provide supportive care and education for the family about caring for the child at home. Signs and symptoms of congenital heart disease are failure to thrive, poor weight gain, cyanosis, pallor, decreased peripheral perfusion, distended pulsating neck veins, active precordium, irregular heart rate, murmurs, clubbed fingers, crackles, fatigue with feeding or activity, choking, strider, increased work of breathing, and diaphoresis. Let's look at some congenital heart problems that cause increased pulmonary blood flow. First, patent ductus arteriosus, or PDA. In utero, much of the fetal blood flows through the ductus arteriosus from the pulmonary artery to the aorta, bypassing the lungs because the lungs are not yet in use. The ductus arteriosus should close soon after birth, establishing normal blood flow. With a PDA, patent ductus arteriosus, the ductus arteriosus fails to close at birth or reopens due to hypoxia. Blood continues to flow from the higher pressure of the aorta into the pulmonary artery with oxygenated blood recycled back to the lungs. There is an overload of pulmonary circulation and an increased workload for the heart. Signs and symptoms are dyspnea, bounding pulses with a hyperdynamic precordium, 
and a wide range in pulse pressures. There is a characteristic swishing mechanical murmur. PDA is seen most often in preemies and most often in girls. Definitive diagnosis is made by a 2D echocardiogram. The defect can be corrected by medical intervention such as oxygenation or administration of indomethacin. Surgical ligation is done via video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery or VATS which is gaining popularity as an alternative to the traditional thoracotomy. Next, the septal defects. Atrial septal defect, or ASD, is an abnormal opening between the left and the right atria. Oxygenated blood from the left atrium is forced back to the right atrium in what is called a left-to-right shunt. Most are asymptomatic, initially diagnosed when a loud, harsh murmur is detected during a routine exam. Definitive diagnosis is confirmed by cardiac catheterization, ECG, and echocardiogram. The defect may close spontaneously or it may require surgical repair via sternotomy. The child will need continued follow-up but has a very good prognosis. Ventral septal defect, or VSD, is an abnormal opening between the right and the left ventricle. It is the most common congenital heart defect. With a VSD, blood is forced from the left ventricle back into the right ventricle, also a left-to-right shunt. A loud, harsh murmur is heard. The defect can be mild or severe and often occurs with other cardiac defects. Small defects may close with growth. Medical management includes close observation, frequent ECG and physical exams, and prophylactic antibiotics for dental care and surgeries. With a more severe defect, heart failure and pulmonary disease are seen. Early surgical repair has a low risk and a good prognosis. In most cases, there is normal growth and development within one to two years after the repair. Surgical repair requires open-heart surgery with heart-lung bypass and hypothermia. The defect is either ligated or patched. Tissue grows over the patch within six months. What about defects causing decreased pulmonary blood flow? First, there's a coarctation of the aorta, a narrowing of the aortic arch or descending aorta characterized by a significant difference in BP and O2 saturation between the upper and lower extremities. Proximally, or before, the defect, there is increased pressure with decreased pressure distally. Pressures are lower in the lower extremities. The child with coarctation of the aorta may be asymptomatic until late childhood. Treatment is related to the type and severity of the defect. Infants with symptoms of CHF are managed medically until surgery is possible. The optimal time for surgery is between ages 2 and 4. The narrowed section is resected and the ends anastomosed. A large defect may require placement of a synthetic graft. Restenosis may be corrected via balloon angioplasty. Signs and symptoms include leg pain after exercise, an enlarged heart seen on x-ray, ribs that are notched related to collateral circulation, and BP and pulse rates that differ in upper and lower extremities. Coarctation is visualized on 2D echo. Now, complications related to coarctation of the aorta, CHF, hypertension, and infective endocarditis. Remember, the prognosis is generally good, but it is related to the presence of other defects and the general health of the child. Tetralogy of Fallot is a combination of four heart defects that interfere with the blood flow to the lungs. Surgical techniques allow early repair of this complex heart defect so that most affected children live normal or near-normal lives. The four defects are pulmonary artery stenosis, which decreases blood flow to the lungs, hypertrophy of the right ventricle due to pulmonary stenosis, an overriding aorta that's displaced to the right so there's flow from both ventricles, and VSD. Signs and symptoms evident in the child include cyanosis, clubbing, a squatting position to increase systemic venous return, feeding problems, growth retardation, failure to thrive, frequent respiratory infections, dyspnea with feeding, crying, exertion, and polycythemia, proliferation of red cells triggered by hypoxia. 
Earlier we mentioned TET spells, paroxysmal hypercyanotic episodes that start in the first two years of life. The child may have spontaneous cyanosis, respiratory distress, weakness, and syncope lasting minutes or hours and followed by periods of lethargy and sleep. The child assumes a knee-chest squat position to improve blood flow to the lungs. Chest x-ray shows a characteristic boot-shaped heart. Also done are ECG, 2D echo, and cardiac cath. Complications include cerebral thrombosis due to polycythemia, especially with dehydration, iron deficiency anemia related to decreased appetite plus increased expended energy, and bacterial endocarditis, which is prevented and treated with antibiotics. The goal of treatment is to increase pulmonary blood flow and decrease hypoxia. It can be surgical with the blaylock tausig procedure for infants. Older children will have a total correction of all defects. Before surgery, IV prostaglandins might be given to open the ductus arteriosus. What about the treatment and nursing care for children with no symptoms or mild symptoms? No specific treatment is indicated. Normal activities are generally okay with good general health, dental care, nutrition, immunizations, all important. Children with moderate disease must avoid rough, intense action sports, but can participate in most physical education activities as long as they remember that they must conserve energy. For transplant candidates, no live virus vaccines, prophylactic antibiotics for dental procedures, and prompt and aggressive treatment of infection. Nutrition and hydration concerns include preventing anemia and promoting optimal growth and development. Fluid intake, prevent dehydration, especially in hot weather. Other concerns are high altitudes and cold temperatures. Next, the transposition of the great arteries. Here, the two major arteries leaving the heart are transposed, with the aorta rising from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery from the left ventricle. This defect is incompatible with life unless there is some connection between the right and left sides of the heart, such as a VSD. An emergency septostomy is performed to create a connection. The corrective surgery is called the atrial switch procedure. Signs and symptoms include severe cyanosis occurring within hours or days. When the ductus arteriosus closes, there will be VSD and ASD, CHF, and murmurs. Next, defects with the variable or mixed pulmonary blood flow. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome is the underdevelopment of left side of the heart. The left ventricle is absent or non-functional, and there is a hypoplastic ascending aorta. Initial survival depends on PDA and an open foramen ovale. The symptoms are a gray-blue color, CHF, weak pulses, dyspnea, and heart murmur. The prognosis is very poor without surgical intervention, which is a heart transplant. Even after surgical repair for congenital heart disease, children are at an increased risk of infection involving the heart and its valves. Parents of children with heart defects and adults with repaired heart defects should discuss with their health care provider whether or not they need to take antibiotics prophylactically before certain dental and surgical procedures.